Lord, I ask that you would change us, that we'd leave different. In your name we pray, amen. I'm just super excited as we're starting a brand, go ahead and take a seat, we're starting a brand new series right now, and I, I, here's what I believe, and the, the word that God gave me this morning during prayer was restore, and re, uh, restore and reset. It's almost like um, when, you're, when your phone, it gets bogged down with stuff, right, it's time to reset it back to the factory settings, and I think that's what God's doing right now in the churches across the world. It's not just a lifeway thing. When I talk to all my pastors and friends, we all are recognizing God is starting to push a restart on what the church is supposed to look like from the beginning. To take us back to the factory settings. Just like our pastor friends in Cambodia. I've got a picture here of them. And we support them. We pray for them financially. We support them. And lives are being changed all over the place through Pastor um, Merlin uh, and all her team right there. And the guy, God is moving in a powerful way. I'm going to share testimonies down the road, and, and down the road, but you're going to be blown away what God is doing all the way in Cambodia. It's not a California thing, an Oklahoma thing, a Texas thing. It's a world thing because this world belongs to him. Amen? Amen? But I believe there's an awakening taking place. I believe it's a new season. And God tells us this in Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Aren't you excited that you get to be in this season where he's changing the church back to its original intention? Will you allow God to change you in this process? Because you have a choice. The title of this series is called The King's Dream. The King. See, Jesus is the king. And he has a dream for what the bride is supposed to be in the beginning. You're the bride, the local church. You're the bride of Christ. Think about that. The bride of Christ. It's his dream. I could have titled this series, The True Nature of the Church Being Restored. But that was kind of long, so I just went with the king's dream. My prayer, though, in this series is that God offends your mind. I pray, Lord, offend your people's minds. You see, everywhere Jesus went, he was about offending people's minds, the way they think. He was trying to get them to think differently than how they were thinking in that moment. Many received it. Many walked away from him. You have a choice. Today's title, week one, is called Kingdom Culture. What's the culture of the kingdom for, for Jesus and what he wants for his bride? In Luke 4, in just a second, I'm going to read it. In Luke 4, verses 16 through 22, if some of you want to turn there, we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. In this setting, Jesus goes into the temple. And for the first time, the religious people feel the presence of God in their midst, right? They've only heard about him, right? Jesus tells them today in scriptures, they've been fulfilled right in front of your eyes. You see, and he quotes Isaiah 61, the same one they've read hundreds of years. You see, they've never had it today. They've only been thinking about a tomorrow that's going to show up, and tomorrow shows up, and they miss it. They weren't used to hearing God's voice. Never a today, only a tomorrow, and they, they're stumped. Chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went, up in, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It's time. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And this last part, part just blows me away. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? The atmosphere had just changed. They knew something had shifted, but it went from here, something's happening, to their thinking, isn't this Joseph's son? 
Can you understand why it's so important? If we don't think differently, we'll keep doing what we've done. They were, off, they were receiving what Jesus was doing in that moment, and then it butted up against their thinker. Jesus begins to preach right then and speak to them and read scripture. His presence is released, right? And they take notice. You see, they've only read about the kingdom. At this point, they've never experienced the kingdom, and it made them uncomfortable. That's why Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. I'm right here. He's trying to get them to change the way they think. Jesus is saying the reality is available to all. The kingdom of God, the reality of his kingdom is available for anyone who believes. So picture Jesus is speaking in his hometown where he grew up, his hometown, right? Everyone knows he's a carpenter's son, right? But when he reads, the atmosphere changes. Something is ignited in them and around them. Jesus, Jesus finishes reading. He said he sat down. And they stared at him. Why are they staring? Because they just became aware of another kingdom. I want our church to be aware of another kingdom. That's what will get many of you and me included unstuck from the realities of this world. And Because when the kingdom of God shows up, things change. You see, God's kingdom always will clash with the kingdom of this world. And it won't make sense to your thinker. It won't make sense to your thinker. The spirit of God is within you. You're a carrier of God and he wants out. He didn't enter in you to be held captive. He entered in you to flow through you like rivers of living water that flow through you, not pond up like a dam. I'm asking the Holy Spirit right now, Holy Spirit, would you break the dams in people's minds and their hearts? Break the minds, break those, those dams that have built up in our minds and our hearts that we've kept everything at bay because we're comfortable in this little bit of salvation. Would you allow God to expand your kingdom thinking today? Because what you think about will become your reality. If you stay in this little world, that's all you get. But Jesus paid a big price so you could have more, more, Right? And it's fun. It's exciting. Whoever's a boring Christian, they're over here not doing it right. Because this is fun and exciting. I never know what God's going to ask me to do next. I'm walking through the mall one time, and my son Cody, I look over there, where is he? And he's over there bending down, praying for someone's foot to be healed. Son, yeah, the Holy Spirit came and said, pray for that lady's foot. When the kingdom of God shows up, you're more concerned about the king than you are about yourself. But usually we got that backwards. We're more concerned how, remember, our, it'll, you'll, God will begin to stir in you. You'll feel impressed to go do something. You know what you're supposed to do. And then it butts up against your thinker. What if they don't receive it? How will I look? He releases the kingdom and lives were constantly in change. That's what Jesus came to do is release the kingdom. The disciples are amazed, right? And Jesus turned to them and says this, something very amazing. Look at uh, John chapter 14. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, raise your hand if you believe in him. This is you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Everything that you've read that Jesus did in the word of God, you have access to and to do even greater things. Because that's what he said. I'm not up here giving you a motivational speech. I'm just reading scripture. Jesus is about changing lives, and it starts with us changing our thinking. So how do we think God thoughts? How do we change our thinker? Because where you think from will become the reality that you live from. The kingdom of God is activated by faith. You don't have to be rich in faith to, to walk in the kingdom. You just got to have a couple bucks. Size of a mustard seed. It's not about the size of your faith. It's you just bring a little faith to the table that activates the kingdom of God in that situation you're going through. Many people think they're thinking differently, but I want to say this because I've done this. I'm not thinking kingdom thoughts. I'm just rearranging my own thoughts. And I've just rearranged my own thoughts, and I wonder, where's the power? Lord, how come you're not showing up? Because my thinker's stuck over here, and God wants me to think differently from a kingdom view, from a, the kingdom of God. Now, here's how I used to think. And I've been asking God, change my thinker, because I, like, I don't like this guy's thinking, to the picture where we had our slides on, and back to this, kingdom culture. 
And it's been like since I've been asking the Lord for more. That rhymed. <laughs> asking the Lord for more. Like a light bulb, more of the kingdom has been happening. I'm, I'm thinking differently. I'm, I'm praying differently. I'm releasing the kingdom over every situation in my life. I'm not just praying for people. I'm expecting a change when I pray. There's a difference. You see, if you follow the laws of this earthly kingdom, right, you cannot e- expect to get the benefits of his kingdom. See, Christians, we live in two worlds. That's the truth of it. We live in this world, but look at Philippians chapter 3. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This world says, but believe, or this world says that I'll believe it when I see it. But kingdom thinking says, believe now and you'll see later. <laughs> kingdom thinking is almost all the time opposite of the world's thinking. It'll butt up against your flesh, and you have a decision to make. I can think from the flesh, that's what the world says. Or I can think from a kingdom mindset and call down the kingdom of God, which has the power to change the situation. Lord, would you unstick what's stuck in our heads that doesn't line up with your word? You see, in this world, if you jump off a bus and you land on the ground, you're going to break your foot. It's called the law of gravity. Tried it. (laughs) Gravity is real. But in God's kingdom, you can walk on water. It's the law of his kingdom showing up on earth. The disciples asked Jesus something amazing. See, they see Jesus doing all these miracles. And they don't tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, how do you do the miracles? Show us the cool tricks. They say something profound. They say, show us how to pray. You see, they've recognized Jesus gets up early and prays with the Father. And then from his relationship with the Father, Jesus goes about changing people's lives. It's amazing. A light bulb came on their thinking, and they said, teach us how to pray, not the cool tricks. And then they say, teach us how to pray, and Jesus gives them something simple. That's for us. These are the disciples. Your disciple says this in Matthew 6. Jesus says, pray that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're to pray that things are up in the heavens to call them down right now. Why would you wait to get in heaven what you have access to right now? The challenge is learning how to think from heaven to earth. But just like the law of gravity is consistent, when you pray in faith, what's up there comes down here. It's, just, it's consistent. Believing for the kingdom of God to show up with evidence. Everybody say evidence. Evidence is an expectation that God's stepping into this situation. We have forgotten to pray for evidence. It's almost as if, God, if you're busy, I'm going to pray, but maybe you're probably busy. We lean more on the God, you're busy side than we do on the lean side that, God, you're going to show up with evidence and things are going to change. But we, we will always reflect the nature of the world that we're most aware of. I'll say that again because this is truth. You'll always reflect the nature of the world that you're most aware of. If you only think from this world, you will not reflect what is supposed to happen from here, right? So God's right now, listen. He's changing us. He's flipping the script on our thinking. There's a change taking place in the church right now that will receive this change. What do you think happens when you lay hands on somebody to pray for them? Have you thought about that? You see, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And when you lay hands on somebody, there's actually a release of presence. When you do an act of obedience combined with faith, there's a releasing of the kingdom of God. Now, the whole purpose of laying of hands on somebody is an impartation of the Holy Spirit who has power and fire to change someone's life. There's a releasing of what's inside you into someone else's life. That's why we lay hands. Maybe you didn't know that. God said many times throughout the Bible, I'm going to be with you. And every time he says, I'm going to be with you, it's followed up by something impossible that they can't do in the natural. If God's with you, you're about to walk in the supernatural. Right? That's why every... You're about to walk in this. Everybody say supernatural. I want you to be able to see that with, say that with confidence and not feel awkward. It's only awkward if you're not used to it. God always reveals his presence when he gives us something impossible to do. He says, seek me and you will find me. God is waiting for us in this season to find him. Listen, and he's not over hiding. 
Little kids play hide and seek. One tries to hide super good and you never find them. Right? I was an honorary kid that would hide like down the street. You never found me. And I come back two, years, two hours later like I won. And they'd be doing something different. I'm like, well, how can you guys couldn't find me? God is not over hiding. He's waiting to be found in this season for churches that will pursue him. Can a believer champion a theory but have no evidence? Can you talk about something and believe it, but there's been zero evidence in your life, so you don't really believe it? Yes, you can, because I was that person. We started the church. I began to preach and talk about healing and that God can show up and heal, right? But I actually didn't really believe it. At best, I believed it for other people, but not for me, because I think we're guilty that. Sometimes we're praying for people. We pray for them. We actually can expect the kingdom to show up in that situation. But for our own self, I'm not quite good enough. I was actually at Gateway Church. Remember, there are big brother church that we get a lot of training and development from, and we're there at a conference, and they had a special healing night one night. And I told Tanya, hey, what do you think about going to the healing night? And she said, let's go. So I went up there. Listen, a non-pastor, a regular Christian, right? Not that I'm super, I'm just, sometimes we can think only a pastor can do stuff. That's a lie, right? A non-pastor goes, what's wrong? I said, I have a tremor in my hand I had for 10 years, and my hand would shake terribly. That's why I wore this to begin with, because I was embarrassed, because I'd hold a mic and my hand would shake super bad. And I was embarrassed. I'd pin it to my chest, but I knew that wasn't right. I was at the point of taking medicine. My wife's an RN, and, you know, along with being a pastor. And, and she said, maybe it's time for medicine. I said, I know, maybe too. It's getting worse. Anyways, listen, we go to the healing night. I, he goes, put your hand out. And I stuck my hand out. He puts his hand on top of my hand, and he goes, tremor be gone in the name of Jesus. He removed his hand, and my hand has been steady for 10 years. <laughs> listen. Listen. It was generational. You know, things can get passed in your generational line, but you don't have to receive it. You can stop it. That's when the kingdom of God shows up. You see, my mom had a, sh- a tremor, and her hand would flap so bad, it got to the point where she'd sit on her hand because she was embarrassed, right? I get in the car from that healing. First miracle I've actually been a part of for me. And I said, Lord, thank you so much that you would heal me. And I just had a little bit of faith. I just went there. I don't even know if I expected to be healed. But I positioned myself, I took one step. He said, Terry, I didn't do that just for you. I did that for Lifeway Church. The kingdom of God show up in your life is not just for you. You see, the Christian life is simple. It's not complicated. It's this. Everything belongs to Jesus, and I do everything he tells me to do. That's everything belongs to him, and I'm going to do everything he tells me to do. Right? The problem is the heart. This is the problem. You see, the the heart will take you places that your head can't fit. It's your thinker that gets in the way. Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, it's the voice. The voice and the presence are the same. You see, that's why he calls himself the word of God. Religious institutions, (laughs) this Listen, they cannot improve on the Holy Spirit. He's the cure-all. See, once you have one thing that fixes everything, right, it's tough to improve on anything. Religious people will always be frustrated because they cannot improve on the Holy Spirit no matter how good they try to be. Jesus shows up at the temple and he offends their religious leaders. He tells them, basically, in my version, your thinker's broken. Your thinker's broken. Jesus says, you have written rules, but you don't know the author. You have religion, but no relationship. You know about me, but you don't know me, and I'm right here, and you still don't even see me. Jesus begins to tell them, it's from me that you get to the Father. And this offends them, because they thought they could work their way in. It offends them. Jesus tells them, no one goes to the Father except through me. When Jesus presses up against the way people think, they have a choice. Just like many of you, you have a choice. The season that this church is moving into, you'll have a choice. The religious people were uncomfortable. Listen, Jesus messed with their religion and their tradition, the way they've always done it. People have caught me as a pastor. Pastor, we're changing. Mm, Don't know if I like it. Absolutely, we're changing. Jesus shows up, he changes things. 
Jesus seemed to talk a lot about the kingdom of God. You see, most biblical teachers, they talk a lot about salvation, but salvation is a piece of the kingdom. Why is it a piece of the kingdom? It's a piece of the kingdom because it's a miracle that your sins are completely forgiven. That's the kingdom of God showing up when you, so you, I don't know about the kingdom. Well, you've already walked in the kingdom one time when you got saved. You see, when the gospel writers summarize Jesus' teaching, it's all about Jesus came to proclaim the good news, right, and that the kingdom of God is near. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What's the Holy Spirit telling you right now that you need to repent from? And maybe something totally different than the person next to you. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus typically begins his parables by saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like, right? He described choosing to follow him as entering into the kingdom. That's step one, you're entering into the kingdom, right? So what exactly is the kingdom of God? Think about what's up in heaven. Health, joy, peace, wholeness. No more anxiety. No more broken bodies. No more depression. No more mental illness, no more addiction. All those things are up there, right? They're not allowed up there. And Jesus says, you can pray down heaven right now. He's given you spiritual authority and an assignment. He told you, pray like this. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. Pray like this. But how many of us are constantly praying from a kingdom view other than a worldview? Lord, change my situation. It's not a kingdom prayer. That's a baby prayer. It's time to have a grown man and women prayers, right? And I'm talking to myself. Luke 4, chapter 4, verse 30, 43 says, But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. If Jesus is our example and his purpose was to preach the kingdom, don't you think preachers should preach about the kingdom? I don't know, I, I have waited a long time to really to, to move into this position as a pastor, and I apologize to you as a church. See, when you got saved, you became a new creation, and you're supposed to be living your life from the new creation, not the old world, the kingdom world, right? God wants you living your life, every thought you have, Immediately, let's say it's a job situation. That's a hell. Every thought, your first thought should not be go to the doctor. Got to call the doctor. Your first thought is, I'm taking this to the king. King, what do you say about this? And I'm whatever he says. I'm praying down the kingdom of God over that situation. I'm not anti-doctor, but I'm more about the physician. I need the physician to show up in my situation to change it. The doctors are just helpers. But it's a process. Scripture says we go from glory to glory. That means the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you'll begin to think like him, live like him, talk like him. Those things you used to be able to do, you'll no longer find pleasure. In fact, you'll start to be, the Holy Spirit will begin to convict you. Why are you still acting like when you first got saved? You've been saved for five years. You should be thinking differently. And that means living differently. Where's the Holy Spirit telling you right now that you need to change your lifestyle in some areas? Speak to us. Because until we think differently, we won't do what we think can't be done. You'll be stuck. Kingdom thinking is what God thinks in heaven about our situation. You see, we should get super excited when Jesus steps into the room. Do you know he says he shows up or two or more gathered in his name? That means he's here right now. Like Peter, when he got excited, he sees Jesus walking on the water in the storm, in the storm. And he decides to do this. Three words that I want us to put in our head, go for it. Peter decides to go for it. He steps out of a boat knowing he will sink and die. But he has, he's, he's thinking from the kingdom. It's a kingdom mindset, right? Until the water begins to splash up on him, right? And he focuses from a worldview. The reality of the world starts to sink in. And he takes his my, vision and mind off the king and he begins to sink. But aren't you glad that Jesus is so gracious? He reaches down and he picks Peter up and he says, where's your faith? It's a little bit of faith that activates a kingdom. So here's some scriptures to help us move forward to being consistent kingdom thinkers. Consistent. 
Not once in a while. I want this to become our new norm of I'm consistently thinking from the kingdom first over every situation. I get in my car and I'm driving and my wife and I are having a little argument and I can tell the atmosphere is odd. It's not normal. It's not my... It's not what I normally live from, and I can tell because you'll get to where you can tell when it's not a kingdom normal. I'm going to release that kingdom in my car. In the name of Jesus, I pray for peace and unity in this car. Watch the atmosphere shift when you start to just do what God told, has called you to do to call the kingdom down. In your home, with your kids, at your work, over your finances. Peter's faith activated the kingdom, and he actually walked on water. It's amazing. Now, here's some scriptures to help us move forward. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Think about, there's that word think. Think about the things of heaven. It's right there. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Look at the Passion Translation. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities. So good. And not with the distractions of the natural realm. Don't be distracted by the natural realm. Sometimes the people of God have to have all their comfort taken away before the kingdom shows up. Lord, make us uncomfortable. So what chokes out God thoughts? You see, pride will choke out God thoughts. Lack of faith, doubt, unbelief, laziness, lack of discipline. Jesus was disciplined. He got up every morning, spent time with the Father. He was disciplined. Then he had the strength to finish his race. Humbleness activates the kingdom. You see, when you mature, you should become more and more humble. Okay? You can actually get older but not spiritually mature. Do you know that? I know people that have been Christians for 20 years and there's really no roots to them. There's no depth. And then I see a Christian that's been a Christian for one year and they've been hungry and they've been feeding on the word and they've got these deep roots and there's something different about them than a 20-year-old Christian that forgot what it means to be hungry. Paul in the Bible who wrote a third of the New Testament, this is Paul that got caught up in the third world. He was constantly thinking from a heavenly perspective, right? He comes back down and he tells the disciples, listen, I can't even tell you what I saw because your thinker couldn't handle it. (laughs) That's the truth. But here's 10 years, this is Paul, 10 years before he dies in Ephesians chapter 3, it says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then here's one year before Paul dies. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Listen, 10 years before he dies, he says, I'm the least among the apostles. And then one year before he dies, he says, I'm the least amongst the sinners. He just keeps going down and down because Christ has kept going up and up in his life. See the change? It's a kingdom view. I'm getting further away from the worldview that says if you're not first, you're last. Second place all looks the same. It's a kingdom mindset up here. We also know if you don't want the kingdom of God, be proud. Look at what Jesus says. James 4, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Look at at the message version. You're cheating on God if all you want is your own way. Flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against a willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. See, whenever you strive for position, you think you've earned something. You've actually taken your place out of the kingdom and you've entered the world. That's kingdom, that's world thinking. I've earned it. I've deserved it. What do we really deserve? Here's an example. A few years ago, I'm at a a, a pastor's conference, and they had a bunch of pastors together, and um, they were talking about putting someone in a position, and I had this thought. Thankfully, I didn't say it, but this was my thought, right? Surely, they're going to pick me. I'm the most qualified. I'm talented in this area. Lord, do you know you see me? As soon as I had that thought, I disqualified myself. I was never asked. God will not work with the proud. He partners with the humble. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Access to the kingdom is humbleness. Jesus says, I'm humble and, and I'm gentle. You need to follow my example, Terry. 
See, if you want access to the Father, you've got to follow what Jesus did. Jesus set the example for us in every area. See, when you step out of one kingdom, you actually step into another kingdom. There's no three kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the light, and there's the kingdom of darkness. The devil wants you to think you're not over in the dark, you're kind of in the gray. Maybe not where you need to be. You're thinking from this point of view. Listen, you're either thinking from the kingdom of light or you're thinking from the rest of the kingdom. There's no middle kingdom. When something happens in your life, your first take, if you'll discipline yourself, if you'll discipline yourself and you think from a kingdom mindset every time over every situation, watch, that's when things change. That's, what, that's when things change. See, in a reforming, though, takes a while. Trust Jesus in the process. Everybody say process. It's a process. Trust him in the process. Another aspect of the kingdom is to have a tender heart. Tender heart. The enemy, you have a real enemy that wants your heart to get hard when things don't go your way. He wants you to have a hard heart because God will not partner also with pride but also a hard heart. You have to constantly discipline yourself to have a tender heart. It's a gateway, for the, a gateway for the presence of God to flow. But you ha- constantly have to cultivate it. Raise your hand if you like to garden. Anyone like to garden and grow stuff? Oklahoma, we should have a lot of gardeners, right? Check it out. It's like a garden. Remember, you pull weeds, right? Get those weeds out of there. You plant the seeds and you begin to water it. Water activates. Water, spiritually wise, water always represents the Holy Spirit. Okay, but in this area of gardening, you're activating the seeds to grow up, right? What's going to happen? If you don't cultivate it, if you don't pay attention, you're going to come out a month later, you've only watered on a timer, you're going to have grass and weeds growing all in your stuff, right? You have to cultivate your heart. It's a constantly, Lord, in the morning, is there anything in my heart that doesn't belong there? You have to cultivate it. John 2, says this. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You see, we have to come in agreement with all the words that Jesus has spoken. The disciples had to come to that point in their life. Either either are all in and they believe what Jesus said and the word is true or they don't believe. And when they came to realize all of it is true, things begin to change in their life. Shifting our thinking is not new. The disciples had to shift their thinking. It's been around for hundreds of years. It's a roadblock for many Christians and disciples. We have to let God shift our thinking to think from a kingdom perspective, right? Now, some more aspects of the kingdom are you pray in private and you take risks in public. You pray in private, you take risks in public. See, God will only trust you in a crowd if he can trust you alone. If you're not praying in private... How can you expect the king to show up when you pray for someone to be healed? You won't even do it in private. In fact, if you're not doing it in private, there's a 99% chance you will have no boldness to go do it outside your prayer time. What is church culture? Most people choose the church they go to, that, that they're most uh, used to manifestations. That's physical appearance of God showing up. If they, if they want to go to a church that's wild and crazy, nothing, nothing ever lines up to scripture, that's where they're going to go. If they want to go to a church that's really quiet and second guesses and critiques every little thing, right, and that's religion, they'll go there. But kingdom culture has certain attributes that are consistent in the word. Like in Luke 4, there's a culture for miracles for the kingdom of God to show up. How you value movements of God in churches reflects where your heart is. All of it is culture. You see there's a kingdom culture, it's heaven's culture. Heaven does not conform to our world. We either conform to to heaven's culture or you don't get heaven's culture. Culture is like a greenhouse. You see, when I was principal, we we had a greenhouse. I think it's still there, actually. And we plant seeds with the little kids, and these flowers would come. But we are intentional about the climate inside the greenhouse. So things would grow that we wanted to grow, and they'd grow easily. It didn't matter if it was winter outside. It was amazing, right? What is kingdom culture? Kingdom culture is a greenhouse. It causes the things you want to grow to grow. When you target culture, we actually begin to monitor atmosphere that affects the valuable seeds that the Lord has given this house. We're monitoring. Movements of God, miracles, more salvations, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, signs and wonders and evidence will begin to come up in in a greenhouse church that is intentional about expecting and cultivating 
what the Lord said is available to us. Amen? Kingdom thinking is just for you, right? It's when you refuse to have a thought about yourself that God doesn't have about you. That's kingdom thinking. I refuse, and someone says something that who you are, or you have your own thoughts, because sometimes you don't need other people beating you up because you can beat your own self up by your mistakes. It's I refuse to have that thought if it doesn't line up with what Jesus says about me. That's kingdom thinking. You see, when my mind is renewed, it's a tool for the Lord for the kingdom, a renewed mind. Do you know that God says he'll renew your mind as you read his word? The word is active and alive. As you're reading scripture, you say, I don't understand it. Who cares if you understand it right then? He's renewing your mind. It's super. The word of God is alive. It will change you. Of course, I want you to ask questions if you have questions about the word. Just get the word in you. You see, wherever Jesus is welcomed as king, those citizens have access to the kingdom, which is freedom. The king's welcomed here in this church. Amen? Words are reality in the kingdom. That's how the world's created, by the word of God. Words are reality. I think this is an area. You have, kingdom, you have worldly words, right, where we complain about stuff. Why would I release that in the atmosphere that affects me, right? I'm going to take what's going on in my life, and I'm going to speak kingdom words that have authority, I'm going to speak those words that have the power to tear down strongholds in my life, to set me free by coming in agreement with the word of God in my life. That's a kingdom word vocabulary. Why would I ever curse my life? Oh, my life sucks. Why, do I, why would I ever do that and say that? I'm going to speak from a kingdom vocabulary, and that's where things are going to start to change and shift in my life. Everywhere Jesus showed up, there was a clash of kingdoms. Are you okay that he begins to clash in this church? Because it's his. This is his church. He's the king of this place. Will you pray with me as we close? Will you begin to discipline yourself to think from heaven's viewpoint, to call down things in the kingdom? Will you let God change your thinking? Will you make praying in faith for the kingdom to invade your situations, your normal practice? For the kingdom of God is near. It's a new season. It's a new season. Expect the king to show up because he's, he's there and to invade your situation. If you're here today and you, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, he absolutely loves you so much. He paid a big price on the cross so you could have a relationship with him. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord, I just want to give you an opportunity right now. Just go ahead and slip your hand up and say, yes, pastor, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Anyone today, you've never done that, and, and today you want to give your life to the Lord. Father, we just thank you so much for your presence today. We thank you for the truth about your kingdom, that you want us to live. Father, empower us. Holy Spirit, give us strength and empower us, Father Lord, to have a kingdom thinking. And my whole, not just on Sunday mornings, all week long, everything that comes into my life and my family's life, I'm speaking the kingdom of God over it. That's my new lifestyle. Father, we love you so much. You're so good. You're so gracious. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to stand up and sing one more song, and we have a prayer team up here, and they want to partner with you. They want to speak word, kingdom words over your situation. If you've got something you're going through, let us pray with you. We're going to speak kingdom words over it, and the kingdom of God shows up, things change. So go ahead and stand back up, and let's, uh, let's lift our voices up to an amazing king. He deserves our praise. Come get prayer. If you